originally. I am from South Carolina, and I, I grew up most of my childhood years uh, in New Jersey. And, but we have lived for 25 years in the Tampa area, and a lot of what my ministry has entailed has been church planting and church establishment, local assembly establishment, and, uh, and a little bit of writing. And uh, there are some books in the foyer, and um, there may be a little list there. They're $10 a piece, except for the smallest one, which is only $3. And there's a box you can, if you're interested in purchasing it, you can uh, uh, put the money in there, a check or cash. If you want to use some kind of electronic means, PayPal or, or uh, some other means, you can see me about that, and uh, that would be wonderful. We've been thinking in my sessions, and I'm very happy to be here with Brother Raju, and looking forward to a, a wonderful time, and I hope you are, a wonderful time of uh, getting into the Word of God. And we are, in my sessions, we're looking at prophecy. And last night we looked at the rapture of the church. In this session, we're going to do something a little bit different, but I hope it's going to be a rich time of learning for you. We're going to look at, at the millennium, and I'm, I'm very happy for some of the, the songs that have been sung. And uh, we want to look at amillennialism. And not that I am espousing that view, but we want to look at it and compare it a little bit. And I think it's very helpful. You look at something and then look at maybe what is the right view. And I think we learn a lot in that way. And I think it's very important. If you're here, I, I'm, I'm, I'm imagining everyone here uh, is probably a serious Christian. You wouldn't be here. If you'd rather play golf than get into the Word of God, you, you, you probably are not here. You might love golf too, but, uh, but you're a serious Christian because you're here. And you're here to learn. And you're here to get as much as you can out of the Word of God, as much as you can out of uh, those who are ministering the Word of God this morning. And, and this, this conference. And so I hope this is helpful because it is a view that is growing and you will be exposed to it. You will have people come to you and talk to you about it and use language and, uh, because it's a growing view. I think that uh, dispensational premillennialism is probably the dominant view still, but this is a growing view. Recently, I went on the internet on YouTube and I just plugged in this, 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 this short little sentence, errors of amillennialism. I didn't find any errors. Nothing came up that was errors of amillennialism, but I got a lot of information about amillennialism. Those who were teaching it, those who valued it, those who were exponents of it. Now, I guarantee you, if I put into my, that search engine errors of dispensationalism, I would get a lot of information. So there's a lot of information out there, and I think it's very important. Young people, whoever it may be, we uh, had the opportunity of leading a Filipino lady, our neighbor, to the Lord, and uh, my wife has a Bible study with her with a number of ladies on Wednesday morning, but she'll tell my wife, she says, I go to YouTube to learn a lot about the Bible. So people do that. They go to YouTube. If I ask you to raise your hands, you probably have gone to YouTube to listen to something about the Bible. And so it's very important uh, to know a little bit about uh, millennialism. And uh, so we want to do that this morning. Let's just bow in a word of prayer for, for a moment. Our God and Father, we thank you for our time together this morning. And we thank you for this opportunity to gather. We thank you for this local assembly convening this conference. And we pray, Father, that you will lead us and that you will guide us. And may this session be profitable. May each session for the rest of the conference be very profitable. We will go away full. We'll go away learning much about the Lord Jesus. We will go away longing for his return. We will go away desiring to learn more and more 
about the things of the Word of God. So we pray this, we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Now, before I go further, I want to mention a few things. First of all, I want you to take your Bibles and turn to Isaiah chapter 65. But um, I want to mention a couple of resources. I'm going to mention them later in this session. Two books, if you're if you say to yourself at the end of the session, I want to get a book, uh, I don't want to go to YouTube because I won't find anything, uh, but I want to get a book, a good solid book that will teach me about the errors of amillennialism. So I have two right in my hands here. And uh, they're both by the same writer. And his name is Matt Waymeyer. And... Uh, a number of writers that are coming out of Master Seminary are writing and giving rebuttals to the emphasis and some of the teaching and leading teachers of amillennialism. And Matt Waymeyer is one of them. I've listened to him on YouTube. He's not the most dynamic speaker that you've ever heard, but he's a very good writer. Some people write better than they, than they preach. He's a very good writer. This was his first book that came out. It's called Revelation 20 and the Amillennial Debate. It's only 130 pages, 120 pages. It's a good book to start off with to get the idea of what some of the uh, arguments are. And this is his latest book. It's a, a much bigger, and it's called Amillennialism. If you want to look through these books and you want to talk to me about them, that's wonderful. This is something else I brought along, and I think we printed out some copies. This is a paper by David Gooding. There's no charge for this. Uh, and it's about amillennialism, two sides. And we have some available for you, I think, back on the book table area. So feel free to avail yourself of that. Well, let's dig in to the subject. So with your Bibles open, we're in chapter 65 of Isaiah, and we want to read, this is, a, this is a passage about the millennium. Now what the amillennialist does when he comes to a passage like this, is amillennialism means there will not be any earthly reign of the Lord Jesus Christ on earth. No, the Bible, according to them, does not teach an earthly millennial 1,000-year reign of the Lord Jesus on earth. Now, that's a very hard thing to do because from what I've understood from other writers, 25%, 24% of the Old Testament is about the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus. Prophecies of the Old Testament, 24%. And this is one of those passages. We're going to look at verse 18 down to verse 25, is all about the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus. But when the amillennialist comes to this passage, they'll say it's in heaven. This is a scene of heaven. And whenever they come to a passage like this, they automatically say it's in heaven. It's figurative of something else or it's heaven. But let's look at this as we begin our time this morning. Chapter 65 and verse 18, but be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. And behold, I create Jerusalem, a rejoicing and a joy and a people of joy. So we begin to see Jerusalem mentioned 800 times in the, in the Bible. Jerusalem, earthly Jerusalem. In the place where the Lord Jesus Christ was rejected, in the place where he was crucified, he'll come back and rule and reign as king of glory, king of kings and lord of lords. Amen. Jerusalem. Verse 19. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and my joy in my people, and the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. There shall be no more in it an infant of days an infant, there'll be no more stillbirths. Be no more a child being born and he only lives for a few days. It will not happen in the millennial kingdom. But then it goes on to say, 
nor an old man that has not lived out his day. A child shall die a hundred years old. If a child dies at a hundred years old, he'll be considered very, very young. I'm supposing that we will live to 150, 200 years old or older in the millennial kingdom. But we will die. He speaks about death. You don't have to answer this question, but is there death in heaven? You can go like this. No. No death in heaven. This cannot be heaven. Because old, an old man will die, but he'll be quite, quite old when he does. A child shall die a hundred years old, but a sinner shall, shall be a hundred years old and shall be accursed. <clears throat> it shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat of them. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. Like the days of a tree are the days of my people. And mine elect shall enjoy the work of their hands. And they shall not labor in vain, nor shall they uh, uh, nor bring, bring forth trouble. They are the seed of the blessed of the Lord and their offspring with them. It shall come to pass that before I call, he will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear a wolf and a lamb shall feed together. And the lion shall eat straw like the bullock. And the dust shall be the food of a serpent. And they shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountains, saith the Lord. Amen. Now, last night, if you were here, I was afraid my brother was going to steal a lot of my thunder about the millennial kingdom. He was, he was going on for a little while about the lion laying down with the lamb and just all the glories of the millennial kingdom. I was a little afraid, but uh, he, he shifted away from that, and I was very thankful for that. I was feeling my, my message is going to be redundant. Uh, he was doing such a very good job. But I don't, I'm not fearing that too much at this point. But here we have a picture of the millennial kingdom. A number of different things that take place and that a lot of different changes in nature, change, changes in the animal kingdom. We don't have that now, but we will have that in a future day. Many things that we saw in this passage will have in a future day. We don't have today. And I am so thankful we're looking forward to that. I know you look at me and say, you know, Dave looks kind of young, but I'm beginning to feel a little bit of the, uh, uh, the changes of age. You know, I, I, would, I really would like to live to be 200 years old, I think, maybe. Not in the same kind of body, you know, a transformed body, but I sure would like to be in that millennial kingdom. And not only the fact that you live longer, because our Savior would be there. And we would worship him. And those songs were just wonderful, uh, thinking about our time in his presence, uh, worshiping and uh, being ruled and governed and be a part of that governance uh, for a thousand years. But let's get into our, here's some, we say, why should I be concerned about amillennialism? Here's some current books that are very popular. If you put in a book on amillennialism, the middle one will come up. Kim Rillebarger. He's a professor out in California at uh, Westminster Seminary, California, and he's a pastor, and he's, a, he's a, an active uh, exponent of amillennialism. This book is, uh, is, is, is a popular book, and uh, it, it's interesting that these kind of books, you don't buy in bookstores anymore. Well, we don't have bookstores, right? Do we have a Christian bookstore in Houston? We don't have one in Tampa. So you go to the internet, and these are sold in great, great numbers. Kingdom Come is by a man named Sam Storms. He at one time went to Dallas Seminary. He was an ardent uh, uh, premillennialist and dispensationalist. He's, he's gone to the dark side, and, uh, and he's, he's a millennialist. And he's written, and he's, a, he's an ardent exponent of amillennialism. And there's many books you can see on the Internet. And they are being purchased, and the information from them, and podcasts, and presentations, and conferences... And so this emphasis is strong in our evangelical world today. 
It used to be that Amal Anglism was in the Roman Catholic Church and the mainline churches and liberal churches. It's come into evangelical churches and it's growing and growing and more so in evangelical churches. There, there are still many, many dispensational, many, uh, many premillennial uh, leaders, many Bible school seminaries are strongly dispensational and premillennial today. But there's other books that have come out in rebuttal. I just told you two of them. And uh, the middle one is another one by Michael Vlach. He's also at Master Seminary. The New uh, Creation Model, another book on the same subject, uh, also by Michael Vlach from Master Seminary. And, and so there's this, there's this back and forth, a lot of information coming out about this. So we want to think about what is it? What is this subject? And so I'm going to give you a little bit of information about amillennialism today. This is a chart. We're going to do two charts of a little bit of what amillennialism is. These are charts from the internet. And uh, so amillennialism believes that the millennium, the church age, and the tribulation period all run concurrently. They all take place at the same time. We are in the millennium, we're in the tribulation period, and we're in the church age, all at the same time. Then there's one coming, and that is the end. I had a poker, that blue little arrow near the end. The Lord comes again, and then it's eternity. One big age, one big age. And all these things happen at that time, and they begin... If you see that cross, it says this is where Satan is bound. We read in Revelation 20 that Satan is bound so he does not deceive the nations any longer. Now, they believe the binding is a very loose understanding of that word. It's like, it's like binding your dog but giving him a hundred-foot chain, a long chain. So he's very active today. We would look, look at it in a literal sense. When it says he's bound and cast into an abyss and a lid put upon it and it's locked, that means he's not able to do anything for that period of time until he's loosed again. Amen. But according to this view, he's very, he's very active. He's very active. But he's bound he was bound at the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's a little bit of a chart. I like this chart better. Similar chart. At the cross, the millennium begins. At the cross, the tribulation begins. But there's a little bit, his, Satan is loosed uh, at the end, and he brings some havoc upon the earth. He was already bringing havoc for the whole millennium, but now he does it in a special way. Um, and then the second coming takes place, there's judgment, and there's the new heavens and the new earth. Everything runs together. We would say as premillennialists, you have the church age, and then next you have the, the tribulation period, and before the tribulation period you have the rapture, and at the end of the tribulation period you have the second coming, and then you have the millennium, and then you have the eternal state. They're separate events. But for them, it all runs together. We are now in the millennium. And we want to think about that a little bit. But let's go to some background. A little bit of background. I think it's important to read the Bible in a literal, grammatical, historical fashion. We look at the background. We look at the context. Uh, we look at whole sections of passages. We look at some differences in them. We look at word meanings. We look at context. Someone said the most important thing in Bible interpretation is context. The three most important things about Bible interpretation is context, context, context. It's not 100% true. There's many other aspects. A literal, we take it as a literal normative reading of Scripture. We don't automatically spiritualize. We don't automatically uh, look at it figuratively. What it says, we look at it 
When we see a man will, a child shall not live but a few days, there won't be child death. We look at that literally. When the Lord's going to reign for a thousand years on earth, we look at that literally, that he's going to do that. When the Lord's going to come back in the rapture of the church and catch us up in the air, we look at that literally. Amen. When he changes our bodies, our lowly bodies to be like his, we take that literally. We don't spiritualize that. Now, all millennials live like some things literally and then many things figuratively. And it can lead ultimately to not having a strong view of Scripture, a high view of Scripture. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to I'm gonna assume everyone in this room has a high view of Scripture. We look at it literally. We, want to, we believe that's the Word of God. Every word, every sentence, every paragraph is important. We believe it, and it's literal, unless for some reason we're given to understand that in a literal, figurative way. We have some poetic language in the Old Testament. In the Psalms, we have poetic language. And so sometimes we look at it poetically and literally, but most of it we look at literally, contextually. We acknowledge principles and differences in different dispensations. We see that the church will not go through the tribulation period. We look at the, and we look at the tribulation period as a different time than time we live in now. And we look at the millennium as a different time than the age now. And we look at the, the, the age of the law as a different time than the time of the church. We don't confuse dispensations. This is one of the very important things, I think, in understanding of Scripture. You go to the Old Testament. If a child was disobedient to their parents, they could be stoned. Now, I'm glad they didn't live in the age of the law because I wouldn't be here today. I would have been stoned a long time ago. But we don't have that. We don't carry that over. Some of those laws we don't carry over into the New Testament. And so we acknowledge differences in dispensations and the author's intent. These are all important things in Scripture. Now, let's apply this a little bit. This is a quotation from John Wycliffe, sometimes uh, Miles Coverdale, an, an early translator of Scripture. It's attributed to him. But a great quotation of Bible interpretation. It shall greatly help thee to understand Scripture if you mark not only what is spoken and written, but of whom... And to whom, with what words, at what time, and where, and to what intent, under what circumstances, considering what goes before it, and considering what follows it. Well, that's a pretty good rule of Bible interpretation. <coughs> Matthew Henry and others have said, discern the times and the seasons, and all scripture will be in harmony with the self. We make some distinctions between dispensations and ages. Charles Ryrie said, all scripture is for us, all the Bible is for us, but not all the Bible is to us. There are certain things that were said in the Old Testament that was for Israel. When God instructed to build the the tabernacle, that was for Israel. God doesn't instruct us to build a tabernacle. But we learn from that. We learn from these truths in the Old Testament. We don't offer animal sacrifices today. That was for Israel. But we do offer spiritual sacrifices. That is for today. We'll do that tomorrow morning. We'll offer spiritual sacrifices. All Scripture is for us. We learn from it. There's types and beauties in the Old Testament we learn from it. Let's look at an example. Zechariah 10.10. 10. I bring them also out of the land of Egypt. This is the regathering of Israel. And gather them out of Assyria. And will bring them into the land of Gilead and Lebanon. And a place shall not be found for them. But so many that came, come back... It'll be hard to have all, of the, all the people of Israel back in the land again. This will bring them from all of these nations of the world. Now, 
We take that literally. We take it contextually. We take and look at the words. We believe these words, Gilead, Lebanon, Israel, gathered from Egypt. And so we believe that that's what's going to happen. Now, I love Matthew Henry. I'm going to have two, quote, uh, two, two quotations by him. But he's a millennialist or maybe a post-millennialist. So he looks at it figuratively. Just follow with me what he says. Here are precious promises that look further than the Jews. All the way from the Old Testament, we have a reference to the spiritual people of God. The gospel church. When the gospel church was gathered out of all the nations, when the preaching was gathered out of all the nations, after the day of Pentecost, an opposition was given to it by the combined powers of Satan and the world and all of these. Then the sea fled and the Jordan was driven back and the present and the church of Christ is a growing body. It shall spread to distant places. It shall fill Canaan. It shall fill the land of Gilead. It shall fill Lebanon. And so there's no more place for the church of God. No more time for the New Testament church. So you begin to see they're looking at it spiritually. They're not looking at it as a regathering of Israel. What about the passage we looked at last night? The rapture of the church. Here's what Matthew Henry says. The state and condition shall be glorious and happy at the second coming of Christ. The Lord will give notice to his approach. The glorious appearance of the great redeemer and judge shall be proclaimed and ushered in by the trump of God. And he shall awaken those that are asleep and summon the whole world to appear as he judges the world of the second coming. It's very important to be very careful in your Bible interpretation. It says, we'll be caught up together with him in the the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. It doesn't ever mention he's going to judge the world. It doesn't ever mention he's going to come in the second coming. So it's it's very important to look carefully at some of these things. So what are some of the teachings? What are some of the teachings of um, millennialism? First of all, the church began in the Old Testament, according to all millennialism. Church began in chapter 12 of the book of, of, uh, of Genesis with Abraham. There's no future for Israel. The promises of Israel go to the church. We saw that already. There's no rapture. There's no tribulation period after the church age. The millennium is figurative. There's no literal millennium that will take place on the earth. And then this this viewpoint began with Augustine in about the 4th century and was accepted by the Catholic Church and the Lutheran Church and many mainline churches. So when does the millennium begin? According to most scholars, it begins at the beginning of the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's when it begins. According to a very good book by Lorraine Bootner, he says, a millennialists believe, according to Augustine, the millennium began with the first coming of Christ and continues to the second coming of Christ. We're in the millennium now. I have this book at home, a millennialism today. The thousand-year reign mentioned in Revelation represents the New Testament. We're in the millennium now. Now, I want to spend the next 15 minutes or so looking at some, some questions I have. Just some questions. And uh, we want to get into some scripture. So, some questions. And so I would say, what about all the Old Testament prophecies about the millennium? What about a passage that our brother mentioned last night? It says they will, they will turn their spears and their plowshares uh, they will, um, uh, they will be beat their swords uh, and their spears into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. And nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. 
Now, if there is no literal millennium, when does this take place? If the millennium is only in the hearts of people as it brings, as it brings peace to them, when do all these Old Testament prophecies, the one we just read, when does that take place? Is this in heaven? They're not going, nations won't learn war anymore. Is this, is this a picture of heaven? We don't, we don't see that. Where do all these 24% of prophecies, when do they take place? When does the lion lay down with the lamb? When do we find peace on the earth? If we're in the millennium now, where is all the peace? Where is all the nations not learning war anymore? Because we see a lot of war going on. Amen. We see a lot of that. It's a very, very hard thing to think about. Think about that nations that we are living now in the millennium. Now, take your Bible and turn with me to Luke chapter 1 and verse, and verse 31. If there's no literal millennium, if Christ will not reign, he will not plant his feet in Jerusalem. He will not be on the earth. How do we interpret this verse? What, where does this take place? Luke chapter 1 is an incarnation passage. You've probably seen it many times around Christmas. Verse 31 says, Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and his name shall be called Jesus. But next verse, verse 32. He shall be great. When is the Lord Jesus great? Not great in the world now. He will be great in this world. And amen to that. He will be great one day. He shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord shall give to him the throne of his father, David. He's going to reign on a throne out of Jerusalem from where, location-wise, where David reigned. He'll have a reign much like David's reign. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there shall be no end. When does this take place? It has to take place in the millennial earthly 1,000-year reign of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And we say amen to that. We look forward to that day. We look forward to that reign of peace and justice and righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ on this earth. And we are told that we, the church, will reign. We'll be co-regents. We'll reign with him. We'll have a role with him. The 12, disciples, the, the 12 apostles will have a role with him. We will reign with him. We look forward to that day on earth, and one day in heaven. But there is a period of time, an intermediate kingdom, where the Lord Jesus reigns. What about the unglorified saints in the millennium? Now, this is a wonderful thing. We just read Isaiah 65. We see people living 200 years, uh, well, we'll just say 150 to 200 fear, uh, years old. We see children never dying in childbirth. Now, I would say there's some change that takes place in the animal kingdom, but some change takes place in those that live in the millennium. Where do we see that? Do you know anybody that lives 150 years old and being considered a young person? Youth ministries for 150-year-old people. Where do you see that? Where do we see that today? We're, if we're living in the millennium, where do we see it today? We don't see that today. Philippians chapter, uh, chapter 3 and verse 20, for our citizenship is in heaven. From whence we look, we eagerly look for our Savior to come and transform these lowly bodies to be like his glorious body. Well, we'll have chance transform bodies and in these transformed bodies, we will come back again. When the Lord comes again to rule in the millennium, we'll come with him. And there'll be the church in transformed bodies. Those who are on the earth in transformed bodies. Now take your Bible, 
And turn with me to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. The tribulation saints, after the tribulation period, those who have died, will be resurrected and they will have new bodies and they will go in and reign with the Lord Jesus Christ during the kingdom age. Look at chapter 20 of Revelation with me in verse 4. I saw thrones and they that sat on them and judgment was given to them. That is us. That is the church. Thrones. And those who are on those thrones. And, th and judgment with the Lord Jesus was given to them during the kingdom age. That's us. We're sitting on thrones at that point. The rapture is taking place. We've been in heaven. We've been enthroned. We looked at a passage of that, of that last night in chapter 11 of Revelation. But look at the next section in verse 4. It says this, And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God. Now, very specific, not just anyone, not in any age. There are those who are killed for their faith in many ages, but this is very specific. This is during the tribulation. Notice what it says next. Those who had been killed, their souls of them that were beheaded, who were they? Those who did not take, did not worship the image, neither received the mark on their foreheads or their hands. They had been killed. These are raised to life. Notice what it says in verse 4. It says, they lived. They came to life and resurrected. And notice what it says next. And they reigned with Christ a thousand years in resurrection bodies, the church in resurrection bodies. Those who are not part of the church, those of Israel who go into the millennium because of their righteousness and faith in God, be, be, being alive out of the tribulation period, they have transformed bodies as well. Somehow they will live 150, 60, 70 years. So my question is to the amillennials, where do we see this? If we're in the millennium, where do we see all these, these glorified beings? We don't. We see a lot of unglorified beings. We see a lot of ordinary beings, and that's not what's going to happen in the millennium. Now, when is it going to be? When are those tribulation saints going to reign a thousand years? When is that going to happen? It's going to happen when the Lord Jesus is on that throne in Jerusalem. When are we going to reign with him? When he's on that throne on the earth in Jerusalem, reigning for a thousand years. What about animals? When's the lion going to lie down with the lamb? When is the, when is the lion going to eat hay like an ox? I like going on YouTube sometimes to look at animal videos, especially lions. God has put something in them that they are always hunting prey. They're fast, they're powerful, and uh, they're always on the hunt. When are they going to lay down and eat hay like an ox? When is the lion going to lay down with the lamb? When is this trans transformation going to be in the animal kingdom? And we see that mentioned over and over again. We see it in Isaiah chapter 65. We see it in chapter 11 of, uh, of Isaiah, verse 6 through 9. I'm not going to read all these verses for time's sake. But when do we see that? When is that going to take place? If there's no millennium on earth, if we're in it now in a spiritual sense, is it going to be in heaven? We can have oxen and, and animals in heaven. When do we have it? When will we have these, the fulfillment of all these verses and passages in the Bible? What about the chronological sequence in chapter 19 through 21? That's a lot of what Mr. Waymeyer talks about. You begin to see 
a number of events take place leading up to the millennium. You've taken great power to yourself in chapter 11. I heard a voice of many people saying, hallelujah, the Lord is going to begin to reign. I saw in heaven a white horse and a judge, and he comes to earth in the second coming, chapter 19 and verse 11. I saw him come. Didn't see this at the, at the, uh, at the ministry of the Lord Jesus in the first century. This is something, all these events take place in the future on earth. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth gathered, gathered together in Armageddon. All these sequence of events leading up to the millennium. I saw Satan bound for a thousand years. And I saw the tribulation of saints reigning with Christ for a thousand years. All these events leading up in future end times, not now, but the sequence shows these things will happen in the future. Now, is Satan bound now? It's very hard to say that he is. Here's the passage from chapter 20. I saw an angel coming down from heaven holding in his hand a key to the bombless pit. Whether this is a physical pit made of stone or whatever, or a place, a place where Satan is capped and bound, we are not to say. It doesn't say anything about stone or in the earth or anything like that. It's a bottomless pit. There's a great chain. He sees the dragon, the ancient serpent, the devil and Satan. He bound him. Is this a steel chain, iron chain? We're not told, but he binds him with a chain. And he's bound for a thousand years. And he throws him into the pit and he shuts it. And he seals it, and he throws him into the pit, and a seal over him that he would not deceive the nations any longer for a thousand years. It sounds like pretty much that he is incapacitated. He's unable to tempt, to deceive, to be active on the earth for that millennial kingdom until he's loosed at the end. Amen. Now, What are some of the problems? This is a quotation from Lorraine Bootner. He's not a dispensationalist. He's not a premillennialist. The amillennial interpretation, the binding of Satan took place in the first advent of Christ at the cross seems rather far-fetched. That's not my words. I didn't write that. No dispensationalist wrote that. Probably a post-millennialist wrote that. Seems far-fetched and unconvincing. It is open to the objection that if the meaning of the binding of Satan meant that when Christ came at his death, then the loosing of Satan in Revelation 20, 3 and 7 means the opposite must mean reversing the work of Christ. If the binding means the death of Christ, the loosing, can it mean the undoing the work of Christ? It's not my words. This is someone who has a, a certain affinity towards this. An annulment of the atonement, or at least for a time, ineffective. He says, that is impossible. That is impossible even for a little time. Amalenus described the, the, uh, the binding of Satan as restrictions. Now, this is quotations that come from these two books. He quotes a number of writers and just some of the, some of the words they use for the binding of Satan. Limiting. Curbing, curtailing, a relative curtailment, a partial paralyzing, a restraining of the devil's influence upon the earth, but not elimination of it. 
I would, suggest, I would submit to you it would be an elimination of Satan's activity. We cannot live in the, millenni in, in the millennium now because we see so much of Satan's activity deceiving the nations and his activity has not been curtailed in the first century till now. Maybe it's increased. To say that he's bound now, even limited, is so hard and far-fetched to believe. Amen. William Cox says, Satan, though bound, goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. The chain which he is bound with is a very long one, <laughs> allowing him much freedom of movement. That's spiritualizing. That's not taking the word of God as it is written. William Hendricks said, a dog, saints like a dog, bound with a very long, heavy chain, but can do great damage within the circle of his imprisonment. Well, the circle of his imprisonment is all the earth. I want to close with this. Another quotation by Lorraine Bootner. Lorraine, the Amillennius further teaches that there is a restraint placed in Satan in the course of the gospel age, that Satan cannot restra restrain the gospel from going into nations. Is that true? We well, see nations where there is a lot of limitation from the gospel of God. Many nations. Brother Andrew and, and the voice of the martyrs would say there's 150 countries where there's Christians in opposition to the gospel. Every year they bring out 10 top 10 and many others where there's great limitation of the gospel. Saudi Arabia and China and Urea and, and so many other countries of the world, North Korea, Somalia, great, great limitation, sometimes small percentages. And sometimes in certain places where there's opposition, there's a lot of growth, even in opposition, Iran. But we see Satan restraining. They say he's, he's bound so the gospel is free to go to all the nations of the world. Well, that is not true. Here we have Lorraine Bootner saying that is not true. He has a chain of restraint, but he cannot restrain the gospel from going to. That's not true. These are some things about amillennialism that I think is important to know. To me, it's a very hard, hard teaching to accept if we accept the word of God in a normative, historical, understanding of scripture. We have the church age, the millennium, I'm sorry, the church age, the tribulation, the rapture before that, the second coming, the millennium, the eternal state. These are different events that take place, not all at the same time, but you get an idea I hope you get an idea about what is being taught and you get an idea of what the millennium is about. What are some of the, 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 the events and some of the characteristics of the millennium, the literal millennium kingdom, millennial kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ? Let's close in a word of prayer. Our God and Father, we thank you for our time together this morning. We thank you for the future, literal, millennium, thousand-year reign of our Lord Jesus Christ in righteousness and in power. The kingdoms of this world will become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign forever, and he shall cast Satan into this bottomless pit, and he shall reign in peace and in righteousness and in justice and in prosperity for a thousand years. So we thank you for all of these things. We pray this and we ask for your blessing upon this conference, future meetings for each individual one that is here. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.